Good morning and welcome to the worship of our great God and King on a muggy Sunday. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Uh, I'll remind you at prayer time, but to pray for uh, Mike Sanford and I as we uh, travel to Columbia for Synod and Presbytery uh, this week. Uh, deacons meeting, I believe, next Sunday. Uh, I haven't asked when, but I believe it's next Sunday. So um, you deacons, uh, be mindful of that. Um, our faith promise as we kind of finish up missions. Uh, if you have not had a chance yet to turn in your faith promise card, you can drop it in the offering plate today. Uh, there's some cards, I believe, out in the hallway. Uh, if you have it still at home, you can mail it uh, to the church. I believe we're up to about a little over $13,000 now just for the purpose of missions, uh, which is thrilling and exciting. So please take advantage of that if you uh, haven't yet. I welcome uh, some visitors today as well as uh, all of you. Uh, in town today, we're, well, we're delighted to have you here uh, to worship um, as we come to the Lord's table uh, this day. Our call to worship comes from Luke 4. Jesus read from the prophet Isaiah, The Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor and to release and release to the captives. Let's pray together. Oh God, you have assured the human family of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Deliver us from the death of sin and raise us to new life in Him who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and forever. Amen. Our first hymn is hymn 462. Let's all stand together as we sing. our souls like Adam and Eve we are people who hide from you instead of running towards you when we sin in the footsteps of our fallen parents we idolize your good creation and use it to escape from you fashioning pathetic fig leaves and hiding behind the bushes that you have made we seek our own glory instead of yours craving comfort good reputation financial gain safety, significance, and love. We want to believe that we are the smartest, best, wisest, and strongest, 
the most spiritual people. We compete with one another in order to feel superior. and We trample each other with our pride and determination to succeed. We have never sought you with our whole heart, though we daily pursue our own desires with all of our heart, mind, and soul, and strength. Lord, forgive us for our relentless self-love and worship. Holy Spirit, show us where we are weak and poor and needy. Come quickly to deliver us from the bl our blindness and to rescue us from our pride and shame. Help us to see the many lovers that we embrace as we run from you. Convict us of our sin. And give us the sweet gift of repentance and godly sorrow. Show us our sinless Savior who always obeyed His Father, seeking the Father's will and glory above His own comfort and safety. Father, fill our hearts with the reality of Christ's loving pursuit of us so that we may learn to love Him more and more each day. Forgive us and pardon us from our sins. Remove our guilt from us. Clothe us in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. ask you to continue to stand for just a few minutes more and if you'll open your hymnals to the back page you'll find the Nicene Creed there. We read the Nicene Creed on Communion Sundays. It is the church's historic statement on the person and work of Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. I believe in one God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. And he was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again to judge, with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, is spoken by prophets. And I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Our catechism questions as we continue to work on catechizing our congregation is question 28 from the New City Catechism. What happens after death to those not united to Christ by faith? At the day of judgment, they will receive the fearful but just sentence of condemnation pronounced against them. They will be cast out from the favorable presence of God into hell to be justly and grievously punished forever. 
And the scripture that goes with that is from John's Gospel. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. Now we'll have our Old Testament reading. Today's Old Testament reading is Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits. And is his word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord, more for the watchman for the morning than for the watchman of the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption. And he will redeem Israel for all its iniquities. Now let us stand and worship God through song and praise as we sing hymn number 465. New uh, Testament reading comes from Mark 3, be reading verses 20 through 35. Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again, and so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Bezalel. And by the prince of demons he cast out the demons. And he called them, called them to him and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, 
that kingdom cannot stand. And if the house is divided against itself, the house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to the end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong, binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man. And what blasphemies they utter, but who even blasphemies against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they were saying, he has an unclean spirit. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Ricky. So we come to our prayer time this morning. Uh, got an update from Beth Braddock uh, this morning uh, that her test had finally begun to show some bone growth eight or nine months now after her, um, her accident. So uh, we praise God for that. Uh, we certainly want to continue to lift up uh, Ray and Joyce and uh, all of their family with the passing of their granddaughter uh, in the last week. Uh, pray for Mike and I as we go to Synod. This promises to be uh, one of the more um, interesting, is that a good word to use, Mike? Interesting um, synods uh, in a while. And so uh, we're actually going to be in Columbia, South Carolina, as opposed to uh, Bon Clarkin, but uh, pray for that as well. Pray for our deacons meeting next week. And uh, as we continue to move into the summer, pray for our folks as they travel uh, for vacations and, uh, and so forth. Let's go to the Lord in a time of uh, prayer. Father God, as we come uh, this morning, Lord, our hearts are certainly heavy as we weep with Ray and Joyce and their family. Father, we know that you hold all things in your hands. And yet, O oh Lord, such times weigh down on our souls. Father, we pray that you would encourage the Mitchell family in these days, that you would love on them, that we would be folks that, that would be lifting them before your very throne. Father, we're, we're thankful for the answered prayers with Beth Braddock and with her good news. We pray that uh, we would continue with those prayers in the days ahead. Father, for the many on our prayer list, um, we do lift them up before your throne. The shut-ins, Lord, we think of Pat Brown and Bonnie and Laura Sparks and Harry and Merlin Jones and perhaps a few others, Lord, that are homebound and cannot come and worship with us. Lord, for the many people listed in our bulletins, Father, we just plead them before Your very throne. We would be reminded to pray for Brian Kofer as he serves overseas you would bless him for the many that are struggling with cancer treatments and perhaps doctor's reports in the week ahead lord we we ask that you would be with them give the wisdom to those who care for them father for those who live with chronic disease and pain may the light of the gospel shine brightly in their lives 
Father, we pray this month for generous hearts to support our Faith Promise Missions program. We would pray that <clears throat> Synod would go well this week, that we would make wise decisions concerning the governance of this your church and denomination. We pray for Peter Van Mulen as he leaves our community to go to a new community and minister in the Methodist Church. Father, we ask that you would bless him on this, I believe, his last Sunday here. Bless his family as they journey onward. Father, I'm thankful for all those who are here this morning in worship, and we would pray that as we open Your Word that You would speak to us. And then, Father, as we come to Your table, that Your presence would be with us all as we eat the bread broken of Your body and drink the cup of Your shed blood for our forgiveness of sins. Father, we thank You for this church and for the many ministries that we continue to build here, and we would pray that You would uh, open up our hearts to more leading in the days ahead. We ask it all, <clears throat> it all in the very strong name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If you have your Bibles, and I trust uh, that you do, uh, and you would turn with me to um, Romans chapter 15. I'm actually only going to read in a few minutes verses 22 through the end. As I've said several times in the last couple of weeks, uh, we're getting near the end of Romans, and um, I know some of y'all are really, really glad. Uh, we've been here for a while. Um, and we're going to do some different things during the summer. And then, uh, Lord willing, we'll launch into uh, the book of Matthew, um, perhaps by August, maybe a little bit before then. Today, we're going to actually uh, finish up Missions Month. We started Missions Month in May, and May was our missions month, but it's kind of bled over in God's providence into this first Sunday in June, um, not only because there's more to say about missions, but because where we are in the book of Romans speaks so blatantly, obviously, to Paul's heart for missions. Uh, in God's perfect providence, we come to this section. And we're going to look, last week we looked at some, some characteristics of the heart of a church that is mission-minded. We talked about the whole idea of being full of goodness and filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another and that those are all important things as we consider and work towards missions. And this week, uh, we'll see Paul's heart. His calling for missions and our calling uh, for, for missions. It has been my prayer this month that our congregation would have the same kind of heart, that my heart would be animated with the love of missions and that your hearts would be animated with the love of missions, of evangelism, both outside of these walls in our community and indeed uh, around the world. So let's stand as we do each week in honor of God's Word, as we read God's Word as they did in the days of Ezra, so we do here today. We stand for the reading of God's holy word, and I'm going to read 
Romans 15, 22 through the end of the chapter. This is the reason why I have so often been hindered from coming to you. But now, since I no longer have any room for work in these regions, and since I have longed for many years to come to you, I hope to see you in passing as I go to Spain, and to be helped on my journey there by you once I have enjoyed your company for a while. At present, however, I am going to Jerusalem to bring aid to the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. For they were pleased to do it, and indeed they owed it to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual blessing, they ought also to be of service to them in material blessing. When therefore I have completed this, and I have delivered to them what has been collected, I will leave for Spain by way of you. I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together with me in your prayers to God on my behalf, that I may be delivered from the unbelievers in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints, so that by God's will I may come to you with joy and be refreshed in your company. May the God of peace be with all of you. Amen. Father, we pray that you would bless the reading and the hearing of this, your word, but we pray that we would see no man save Christ alone, for it's in his name we ask it. Amen. Be seated. I have said more than once in the last little bit that the word retirement is not in the Bible, that uh, for the Christian, the work of Christ goes on until we are called to our new home. In fact, as I thought about Scripture, I could not come up with a single example in all the Bible of where it said, uh, so-and-so served many years for the Lord and then decided to go to the mountains and kick back and not do anything for God until he died. Nowhere does it say that, right? It's okay to do that, but not to quit your Christian work, right? People retire from jobs after serving a number of years, or if you're in uh, some sort of public sector, you may retire after a number of years put in, not when you reach a certain age, but for the Christian, the work of the kingdom of God continues until God calls you home. It's taught throughout all of Scripture. Donald Gray Barnhouse, the, the great pastor and uh, the one who did a six-volume or five-volume monumental work on Romans, <clears throat> worked until just before he passed away, and in fact, just finished his work in Romans a couple of weeks before he uh, actually died. David Brainerd, on his deathbed, was teaching an Indian boy how to read the Bible in his own language. Jim Boyce, the great pastor of 10th Avenue Presbyterian Church, one of my favorite writers and pastors, preached right up until a few days before he died, uh, or a few weeks before he died uh, of cancer. The call of the work of Christ is till death. I remember a great saint from years ago that uh, was not able to even come to worship anymore. 
a homebound person as we would have in our bulletin. And yet, her work for the kingdom of God was through prayer and she was one of the most powerful prayer warriors I've ever known. She couldn't get out and serve, but she could pray. And I don't know anything more important than that. And so it is with, with Paul. Uh, Paul, at this point in his life, has <clears throat> accomplished more than any missionary in the history of Christendom ever has. He has planted more churches, converted, or been the agent of conversion for more people than anybody. But he's not satisfied, is he? He could have said, guys, I've, I've got this money and, and, and I'm going to take it to Jerusalem and drop it off then and then I'm, I'm moving to Rome and I'm just going to retire in your midst. But that's not what it says, is it? He says, look, I've got this money that these saints have collected for the poor in Jerusalem and, and I'm going there but <laughs> I've got a fourth missionary journey that I want to take I want to go to Spain Paul the great missionary preacher longs for more fields for harvest Yes, he wants to come to Rome. He wants to come to Rome so badly, but he's not going to stay. He wants to keep pushing ahead. There are fields, as Christ says, white for harvest. And he sees them in his mind's eye. And his passion is there. He reminds us in verse 22 and 23 that he has preached throughout all of Asia and, and into Europe now. And, and, and because he's established churches in so many of the major Roman cities of the known world, he looks around and he says, I need to go somewhere where <clears throat> I haven't been yet. I've retraced my steps. I've, I've revisited churches. I've, I've done things to set up leadership but I want to go somewhere where they haven't heard of Jesus. And I want to tell them about Jesus. Those churches can multiply and plant daughter churches and, and move on into other areas. But I've got a passion for those who haven't heard. That's, that's what I want to do. I think of David Livingston, the modern, one of the great modern missionaries whose heart was always forward. I want to go forward. I know I'm not ever satisfied going back. And I'm certainly not satisfied staying still. I want to go forward. I want to find people that need Jesus and tell them about Him. That's Paul's heart, right? And so as he begins to close down his letter that he has poured himself into so much for this church at Rome, <clears throat> he says, I'm coming. I'm coming. But, but first, got to go to Jerusalem. Because these Gentile believers who have a heart for the poor as well as missions, they've raised money for these poor in Jerusalem. And I'm going to take the money to them there. Paul reminds them in verse 27 that, look, when God has blessed you financially and spiritually, you should give financially. When he, when he gives you the means and the spiritual blessing, use that means 
to further his kingdom. And so as he plans to go to Jerusalem, he says after he leaves there, after he's brought that gift, then he'll come to Rome. And there he'll enjoy their company. He'll enjoy the fellowship that we have here on, in, on Sunday morning in worship. And he'll fellowship with them and he'll, he'll be encouraged by them, but he will journey on. He will journey on. He has a fourth missionary journey that he's planned for. Now let me pause right here and say, uh, it is good when an itinerant like Paul can plan and move on. But I will also say that it is really good when somebody comes into a community, puts down roots, spends time investing in the community, and grows ministry there. I think of Alistair Begg, who has been at his church for probably more than 30 or 40 years now. And the impact that he can have because he has invested in that community. So I don't think pastors should just come and, and, and go, but... I think those that are itinerant, that have a heart for missions, need to always be moving ahead. And us in our community need to always be moving ahead within our community, not sitting back on our laurels saying, man, aren't we doing great, right? We got this money in the bank, we got good attendance on Sunday morning, let's just keep rolling status quo. It's not what Scripture calls us to do. So let me give you just a couple of important life points here that I think that we can draw just from this quick foray into these first few verses. While, while we believe and we teach the sovereignty of God here in this church, we teach it and we preach it, the providence of God is good and perfect and God is in control and there are no maverick molecules, as R.C. used to say. The wise Christian should be the Christian who plans. Who plans. Paul is planning another missionary journey. He's planning his trip to Jerusalem. Planning his trip to Rome. Planning his trip from there on to Spain. It is smart and wise for Christians to plan. Never just to coast through life. Saying, oh, God will call me and tell me when I need to go do something. No, we need to be always forward moving in God's creation and in God's kingdom. Sometimes our plans don't work out. We think of Paul uh, wanting to go uh, into Asia, but the man from Macedonia calling him to come over there. God will sometimes, in His providence, change our plans. But we should be people who plan. We should be people who look ahead and who prayerfully plan, knowing that God could take us in a different direction, but always knowing that He wants us to move forward. And we must be flexible within that planning, right? Because certainly God can take us in a different direction from time to time. We must be willing to shift where God shifts us, but we should be people who plan. You know, I, I hope that people say about our congregation that we have big dreams for our big God. That we have big dreams for our big God. I sometimes like to, if we have a short session meeting, kind of at the end of our session meeting, I'll look at the guys and I'll say to them, what is something that you think God might be laying on your heart that's so outrageous 
that we would never have the money to do, we would never have the people to do, we would never have the time to do, but it would be phenomenal ministry in our midst. What is one thing that we could take on for our great God? Sometimes I get blank stares back. Sometimes we come up with great ideas, right? Sometimes that's what it takes, thinking big for God, planning big for God. <clears throat> what is something beyond our church's capability so that we can't look back and say, oh, look what we were able to do, but we look back and we say, can you believe God did that here in our midst? I think about a number of ministries we have now that some almost eight years ago when I got here, we would never have dreamed would be doing today. Now we don't know if Paul ever made it to Spain. What we do know from Acts is that he went to Jerusalem and was arrested there. Now, here's where things have become a little bit confusing. Some believe that Paul was arrested and imprisoned in Caesarea and eventually was released and went to Spain but then was arrested again and came back and was executed in Rome. We do know that he was martyred in Rome. Others believe that no, he never made it to Spain, that when he was arrested and <clears throat> eventually appealed to Caesar and eventually ended up in Rome, once he was arrested in Jerusalem, he never found perfect freedom again. We don't know. There are a couple of early church fathers who, in two different occasions, spoke of Paul's ministry work in Spain, but it's hardly conclusive evidence that he made it there. One, in fact, just says something along the lines of Paul eventually made it to the ends of the known world, which Spain would have been. So we don't know. We don't know if he made it to Spain, but we do know that he had a heart for Spain. He had a heart for missions. He longed, as we should, to spread the good news of Christ into areas that had not, did not know that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. To tell people that Christ died on the cross for their sins, that if they will believe in Him, as Lord and Savior, that they will have everlasting life, that their sins are forgiven, past, present, and future, and that they <clears throat> rest in the glorious hope of life eternal. So as we prepare in a few minutes to come to this table, let me give you a couple of applications that I draw from from this passage. The first is that our work for spreading the gospel is never done, my dear friends. We I don't care how old or young you are. I don't care if you're when in school with his buddies on the football team or who, however old you are, the work of telling others about Christ will always be there. And you have a role <clears throat> in that work. You know, it's easy from time to time to get weary of service to the kingdom of God. Um... And I'll give myself as, as an example. This week, <clears throat> uh, I, I, I found it difficult 
in reading Proverbs. I don't know why. I was just, I'm just tired. It's easy to get weary and, and sometimes burned out in kingdom work. We all need, need rest and to rejuvenate. It's easy to skip a day reading the Bible and studying the Bible. And then the next day, frankly, if you're not careful, it will get easier that day than it was the day before. And by the time you come to your third day, you may not even remember that you were supposed to have your quiet time early on. Or prayer. Or whatever your spiritual discipline is. But Christ calls us ever onward. Always work to do. So let me ask you this as a pointed question. Think back on your last week. What did you do for the kingdom of God? Outside of yourself. Can you point to anything? Well, maybe you needed that week last week to rest. I understand that. But what have you got planned this week for the kingdom of God? Everybody in this sanctuary this morning who believes in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior has been given a gift, a calling. Are you practicing that calling for the kingdom of God or not? Secondly, look for ways to serve Christ and His kingdom. If you can't think of anything you did last week and you really don't have anything planned for the coming week for God's kingdom, think about how you can serve. I love it when somebody comes into my office, knocks on the door, I say, come in, and they say, I want to serve here, can I do that? Man, you want to make it to the top of a pastor's happy list? Do that. Do you know the joy when somebody pops up and says, you know, uh, God's really just burdened me to teach Sunday school. Would you let me teach Sunday school? Or serve however. Lead a new ministry. Think up something. Find out where God is and go there. I love it when somebody wants to serve rather than just sit around and spend their time on their own. God's kingdom is fulfilled through you and me doing God's stuff. Again, find your gift. Plug in. Have a heart for God's kingdom. A heart for God's mission. I'm always amazed at how God accomplishes His ends in creative ways that I would never have dreamed about. When you can sit back and watch the pieces of God's eternal kingdom puzzle fall into place. My mom, at 91, I guess now, um, loves puzzles. Now, they can't be more than 300 pieces, and they got to be big enough so she can see them, and they got to be pretty easy to put together but she loves to do a puzzle and she I was there just the other day and and she said look at this puzzle I have completed all the pieces finally came together isn't that just like the way God does it in his beautiful plan and the last thing that I would just throw out this morning is 
to remember that God can accomplish His kingdom without us, but He has chosen to do it through us. The God who owns the cattle on a thousand hills could provide funds for every mission and ministry in His church. But He has chosen to do it through us. He has chosen to fulfill the ministry that He has assigned to Louisville ARP Church through the pocketbooks and the time and the talent and the energy of you. F.W. Borum in his essay, The Whisper of God, says, God never sends a flood when a shower will do. He never works a miracle when He can achieve His end uh, by uh, the work of uh, someone else and natural law. He never sends a vision or a dream or a revelation when the answer is in Scripture God has provided the means for our ministry here. We just have to take note and do it. We have the time, talent, and treasure in the people that we have here to accomplish great things for God. Greater than what we have accomplished in this church history thus far. We just have to be willing. We have to have a heart for missions. A heart to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to all who do not know Him. And let me close with one last point. Verse 30, I appeal to you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit to strive together with me in prayer. I just ask this morning that you would, as God has reminded us so beautifully here, that we would just be people who strive together in prayer for the kingdom work of this church. We know, having looked last week at those characteristics of a mission-minded church, we know that we meet those characteristics here And now we just need to strive in prayer that God would reveal to us what He wants us to do next. How He wants to grow His kingdom in Jefferson County through this church. And He will do it when we are lay open wide our time, talent, and treasure for Him. Amen. Father, now as we, as we come to your table, uh, we would pray and ask that you would uh, give us grace and mercy as we meet you here. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you all to the table uh, this morning. It is not the table of uh, our Lord Jesus. Uh, It is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ, not the table of Louisville Presbyterian Church. But I also would remind you that if you're not prepared this morning to meet Christ, to partake of His body and blood, that you would just simply pass and not take the elements. This is the bread and the cup of Christ's body shed for us who are believers in Him. <clears throat> Here are the words of the institution as given to us <clears throat> by the Apostle Paul. For I receive from the Lord that which I pass on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night in which He was betrayed, took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This is My body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of Me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Father, we pray that you would 
set apart these elements so much as may be used by them for your holy purposes. Bless the cup, bless the bread with your presence mightily here this morning. But we ask it in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Uh, if you are uh, new this morning or, or uh, haven't been here in a while, just a reminder that uh, because of COVID, we are uh, preparing the elements and giving them to you uh, as you come in. Um, the cup uh, can be a little tricky to open. Uh, we don't pay for dry cleaning, as somebody said, so uh, make sure that you open, uh, open carefully and we'll uh, take the bread and the cup together in just a minute. This is God's body and blood broken for you. And as we come to the table, may we all be reminded that Christ is here, spiritually here. That the bread and the cup are representations of His body broken for you on the cross. That the cup is the representation of His blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. That when we eat together in fellowship and drink together in fellowship, we are remembering Christ and fellowshipping with Him here. Well, in the same way, the Lord took bread and when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. And this is love, not that we have loved God but that He has loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation of our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to also love one another. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. Having given thanks as we have done in his name, he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of man. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by being obedient to the point of death on the cross. Father God, we give you thanks for the ability to come and fellowship in the reality of your resurrection here this morning. May we be nourished by your body and your blood. May we be Reminded that we are cleansed and that we stand clothed not in the filthy rags of our own works, but in the glorious righteousness of Jesus Christ, our Lord. For it's in His name we pray. Amen.
We read that after they finished, before they went out, they sang a song. And we'll stand together, and if you'll open your hymnals to the back, you'll find the words to the song of thanksgiving. Let's stand together as we sing. Now the benediction, may the peace of Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.